Uh, let's go ahead and turn over to Psalm 52. Uh, for those that are watching, we stopped streaming in the class below, but we have still slowly been making our way through the book of Psalms at one pace or another. Psalm 52 is relatively short in its, uh, in its reading, but uh, appertains to uh, some stuff that, that is um, readily uh, accounted for in the book of 1 Samuel. We'll also be looking at the book of 1 Samuel a little bit this morning. Uh, but the um, superscription or the entitlement or the, uh, or the uh, uh, preface to this uh, psalm here says, To the chief mu mu musician Machiel, a psalm of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of Abimelech. Um, Abimelech is um, the priest at the time. Uh, what it is referencing here, or what Doeg the Edomite had told Saul about, was when he visited the temple uh, or the tabernacle at the time um, on his initial run away from Saul, and he obtained shoe bread for sustenance and obtained uh, the sword of Goliath. Um, for his uh, for his weapon, um, and so everything that is in this psalm is in reaction to uh, Doeg hey, and what happened and what he did. Now, before we get into the psalm, and I know you may I made you turn all the way over here, but maybe I should have had you go the other way first. If you want to stick your finger in Psalms or whatever, let's let's go to First Samuel. And I actually want to read um, this account. Um, it's actually in uh, uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 22. If you have sat under my teaching for any length of time or at all, this is well trodden ground. I think there's a, a lot of value in the historical books. Amen. Um, if for nothing else, for showing us how we shouldn't do things. <laughs> um, Psalm chapter 22 in verse 8. Um, or it's not Psalm 22. First Samuel 22 in uh, uh, verse... Uh, I think it's here. Yeah. Um, Let's go to verse 7. Then said unto Saul unto his uh, servants that stood about him, Hear now, you Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make all of you captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? Now Saul was upset. He was not happy that David had got away from him. Actually, in 1 Samuel 19, I think, or 1 Samuel 19 or 20, is where Saul initially comes to Jonathan and the rest of his sons and says, We should... Kill David. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, either Psalm 20 or I think it's 21 that, uh, or 20, no, it's 19, he conspires to kill David. 20, Jonathan goes to David right. and tells him about the plan. And they set up a plan to get David out of there. Right. And then Psalm 21, it is discovered that David, or I think that's in 20 as well, that David is gone and missing. 21, David goes and obtains. Uh, the, the shoe bread and the sword, and then 22 is after all this has transpired. So that Saul is basically saying, I am your king. Mm -hmm. Who who among you is, is, is David uh, this, I mean, David, he calls him the son of Jesse here. I don't think that's uh, specifically um, just to identify him. Um, uh, Jesse was a herdsman. Mm -hmm. Jesse was a shepherd. Uh, as were all his sons, apparently, that we could, as far as we can tell from the scripture, David being um, the, the one sort of left with the sheep when Samuel first comes to look for the Lord's next king. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he specifically said that to sort of uh, minimize him and show it, say, hey, I'm the king, he's a shepherd. Is right. he going to offer you land and food and wealth 
and uh, prestige and office offices inside the court. Um, all of you that all of you have conspired against me. There is none that shoot with me. Uh, that my son, uh, son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, and there is none of you that is sorry for me, or sheweth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Now, uh, Saul goes further to have a pity party about how everybody's against him and how uh, uh, nobody let him know that Jonathan had conspired against him. Now, Jonathan did nothing of, well, I guess... If you want to call it a conspiracy, uh, you, can, you could do that. Um, to some, it may have been a conspiracy. But really, all Jonathan did was submit to what he already knew what the Lord's will was. was and that was for him. Jonathan could have been king at some point if Saul's line had, had, had held. Right. Uh, but Jonathan submitted to the one that he knew. The Lord had anointed Jonathan was 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 both a godly man and he was doing what it was what was required of a a prince of the court of Israel and that is to protect the king. Amen. Um, and uh, but Saul, of course, doesn't see it this way. Um, he also says that David is lying in wait when David is literally sprinting to the Philistines at this time. Right. Um, uh, uh, then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was said over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Nob, to Abimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired, inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. And the king sent to call Abimelech the priest, and the, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, and the priests that were in Nob, and they came, all of them, to the king. Now, it's important to know who Bimelech is. I've already stated that he was a priest, but he's, he's a very specific lineage. He is the great-grandson of Eli, mm -hmm. uh, the, the same man that fell over backwards and broke right. his neck, the same man whose sons carried the Ark of the Covenant in the battle and lost it to the Philistines. This is his grandson. Right. Uh, he was probably the high priest, would be my guess. Um, although it does not say that here. Um, so Saul sins, they all come in. Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And, and he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why hast thou conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and has inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Abimelech answered the king and said, And who is faithful among all thy servants? Who, who, who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son in law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house? Now, Abimelech answers to Saul after this accusation. The, the specific accusation, it's very important to look at this here too. The specific accusation was that Abimelech and David had gotten together and Abimelech had supplied him stuff so that he could murder Saul. Right. And uh, Abimelech said, I don't know where this is coming from because David is the most loyal servant of your house. Amen. He is, he is, he is literally uh, uh, head and shoulders above everyone else when it comes to service, and David had been. David, despite being anointed, never took opportunity to seize the kingship. It was his by right. Uh, I think it was ultimately David's plan, and maybe even the Lord's had Saul not started um, this in his perfect will for Saul to pass and David to rise as king. Mm -hmm. um, for you know to 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 just slip into that spot, and for Saul's sons to let that go, and for God's anointed to take the place of kingship. And and uh, Abimelech says so he, he he does everything you ask him to do. Not only that, he's your son-in-law, right? And he is honorable in thy house. He would never ever conspire to kill you to see something that's already his. Mm -hmm. Did I begin to inquire uh, did did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me, let not the king impute anything unto unto his servant, nor to uh, the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of this uh, of all of this, less or more. Now what David told Abimelech and what Saul is telling Abimelech are two different things. And it seems like here that Abimelech is just trying to uh, deflect. But what he's really saying is here, if this is the plot, David didn't tell me that this was the issue. That this was the thing that he was, that he was looking to do. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Abimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king stood 
uh, said unto the foot, uh, footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priest of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they uh, knew when he fled and did not shew at me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. Now Saul rises up and says, Okay, well, you're going to die, and everybody is, uh, and, all, and all, the, all your brethren that are here. And he turns to his guards and says, Okay, you know, dispense with my justice. Um, and they refused. Right. They not put. I would say one. They knew that Saul was not in the right here, and then mm -hmm. this was just. Uh, it is documented that Saul was oppressed by some kind of evil spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly and consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that it's a, that evil spirit that was putting thoughts like this into his mind. Saul, I think. Was a was was a was a saved man was a godly man because of the spirit of the Lord actually came upon him. He actually preached and prophesied. Right. Uh, uh, you don't see a lot of lost people preaching and pro prophesying. Um, but I think he had some real problems here, and his guards were like, "No, we're not doing that." First of all, these are these are priests. Right. <laughs> these these are these are God. These, you know, if, if David is God's anointed, these people are God, are are like God's direct servants. They're the ones that do all the sacrificing and all this. Uh, no, we're not doing that. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest, and, and slew on that day fourscore and, uh, four and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Now, he did specifically calls them out wearing a linen ephod, which, if you've read anything from like right. what Leviticus and Deuteronomy about the garments of the priest, he killed 85 priests. Right. He wiped out the entire, I, I would say probably the entire working priesthood Amen. at that time. Um, and Nob, the city of the priest, he smote with the edge of the sword both men and women, children and sucklings and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Abimelech, the son of a high tub named Abathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abathar showed David... Uh, that Saul had slain the Lord's priest, and, Abim and David said unto Ab Abathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou, abide thou with me, fear not, for he, he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safeguard. Amen. Now, Doeg goes on, he doesn't just stop at the priesthood, he kills Everybody, right? He kills the he, he kills an, an entire Levitical line from mm -hmm. what, from what we're saying, except for one person, uh, Abathar, the, one of one of Abimelech's sons, he escapes and goes and tells David. And David said, "I knew that Doeg the Edomite was there." I, I, from what this reads to me, David said, "I knew he was there. I knew he was going to tell Saul." But I think the implication is David said, I did not think Saul would carry it this far. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, David knew. He said, I knew when Doeg was in the temple with me, and it is written in, in, in uh, uh, 21 that he was there. Um, I knew that he, somebody was going to find out. I, I just, that, that was a given. I just, it, it's a, it, it is, you know, I, I have occasion. It, it's my fault. That everybody is dead, I mean, and he told them secretly. So that that gives us a a large breadth of context for what we look at in Psalm 52. Uh, so in Psalm 52, in the first verse, why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Amen. Thy tongue deviseth mischief like a sharp razor. Uh, working deceitfully, thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, uh, Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. God shall li likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away, and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living, Selah. Now, the first five verses of Psalm 52, I think, are directed specifically at Doeg. First of all, why boastest thou thyself in thy mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Now he calls him, first of all, so why boasteth thou thyself? I mm -hmm. think he, you know, lift, lifting himself up. But he also goes further and says, O mighty man. Now even Spurgeon, actually I read a commentary on this, Spurgeon said that David here was not calling Doeg, uh, a, a man of might, a man of valor, someone who had, this is sarcasm. Right. <laughs> um, 
He said, he said, he, he kind of gives it that, yeah, oh, you're, you're, you know, oh, you're such a valiant swordsman. You took up a sword against men that had never wielded a blade in their life, save to, uh, you know, slit the, slit the neck of a, of an innocent animal, right. uh, you know, that you, you uh, against women and children, you know, you, oh, you're, you're, yeah, you're a valiant warrior indeed. Right. He said, the goodness of God endureth continually. Amen. Um, thy, uh, thy tongue deviseth mischiefs like a sharp razor working deceitfully. Now, he, he, he says specifically, he doesn't, in the song, he doesn't necessarily uh, call out the murders. He, David goes to the root of what he thinks the causation of all of this was, and that's because Do, uh, Doeg couldn't keep his big mouth shut. Right. Uh, that that he uh, that he more or less accused Abimelech and the priests there at Nob uh, for uh, uh, conspiring with David when there was no conspiracy to be had. Right. Um, verse two also sort of uh, uh, brings to my mind um, about the uh, uh, the verse in the New Testament about the tongue being uh, 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 des uh, desperately wicked, and it's uh, you know your mouth is an open sepulcher. Uh, right. it, it, with the you know, and and I think if there's anything to draw from the account in First Samuel 22 and here in Psalm 52, it's that your words have power. Your words have meaning. Amen. Your words have uh, consequences. Uh, and I think even you know, it, it, you know, it had consequences for the priests. It had consequences for David, uh, but it even had consequences for Doeg. What does it say in verse five? God shall likewise destroy thee forever. Amen. Uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't leave any uh, any um, uh, uh, room for interpretation about what. Doeg's end was going to be, and not because he was a murderer, and he was, not because he was someone who was essentially doing, and we're going to see this in a minute, essentially just doing this uh, for the favor of Saul. Right. Um, but a man that was, uh, that, but but was going to endure this for for life, mm -hmm. for, for 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 what he had to say. So you know, you, if you take this into in, into what we have in our own lives. And what we have to, um, what what we should be doing with ourselves, we have got to watch what we're saying and how we're saying it to people. Uh, uh, somebody is listening somewhere. Your, your words have ha have effect on on people. Uh, 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 the one thing, if anything, that we've not, that I've noticed about Gracie and AJ is that if you say something, they're going to pick up on. it. And it's going to be it's going to become uh, it's going to become part of them. Uh, uh, you know, if, if if you're running running somebody in the church down, uh, uh, you know, uh, in front of a child or in front of somebody else, and that person doesn't really know the situation, maybe doesn't understand that you're just sort of trying to blow off some steam, uh, they're going to pick up on that. Right, and, and that's going to become part of part of who they are too. It, 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 you know, it's it's a it's a it's a powerful weapon, and, and I mean, the New Testament says it the best that it's, it's very difficult to bridle the tongue. Amen. Um, uh, language is one of the is one of the many things that separates us from the animals. Probably one of the most important things we can communicate and convey thoughts. And ideas, and and it, and it is a powerful tool. I mean, it literally, uh, you know, uh, uh, most, if not all, of our Bible uh, was was spoken. It, 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 it is, you know, the, the, if, if you believe in inspiration, and I do, it's, it's literally God breathed. It came from His mouth. It's, it, 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 all of that has power, and I think because God's words have power. I mean, look at Jesus in the Garden of Eden on a very very small scale. He said, "Who seek ye?" And it had a concussive. Effect, um, you know, uh, uh, all the way up to you know uh, the, the, the creation of the world, where a single word can create matter and and energy where there was none before. Um, in the very same way that God's words have power, He gives us the ability for language, and yeah. all words have power, and it's important to remember that. Um, Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying. Uh, rather than to speak righteousness, Selah, thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, he says, not only do you speak lies, but you revel in them. Uh, Doeg was not a, a godly man. Amen. Uh, Doeg was not somebody that enjoyed righteousness. 
uh, uh, Doeg reveled in wickedness. Mm -hmm. Doeg enjoyed uh, what he was doing. I think it's it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. You have Doeg, uh, who I, I, I forget. Maybe maybe it was in Second Samuel. I just didn't point it out. Or Second Samuel, or First Samuel twenty two. I didn't point it out, but um, uh, Doeg is called, uh, the, he's, he's the master of Saul's herdman. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's a shepherd. Uh, so you have Doeg, the shepherd, and you have David, the shepherd. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have uh, two servants diametrically opposed in who they are. Um, and I think Doeg is the kind of servant Saul wanted, and David was the kind of servant that Saul needed mm -hmm. uh and uh but uh, we can we can see where you know just uh, relying on this person uh, uh, caused uh, so much destruction uh, uh verse six the righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him lo this man that uh this man that made not God his strength, but trust in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Now, it, it, in verse uh, in, in verse six, it says, "The righteous shall see." What are they looking at? They're looking at everything that's happening in verse five. They're Amen. looking at Doeg's destruction. They're looking at his uh, loss of place. They're looking at God literally sort of ripping him out by the root, which I think personally means that uh, a Doeg's family line would not extend any further. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it said, the righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. What is Doeg's ultimate uh, uh, goal and purpose? And I think it's kind of applicable and, and more or less what I was saying about the books of history before. Doeg is an example of how the righteous should not live. This, this is this is this is a this is a this is a a look at what happens when you let your mouth just run off in front of uh, whoever and whatever. Right. Amen. Um. He said. He said. Uh, and, and verse seven says. Uh. Uh. It kind of. Pages to get it. Uh, uh, lo, this is the, this is the man that made uh, not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Now, if you remember when we read uh, 1 Samuel twenty-two, the first verse that we uh, or first or second verse that we read, Saul's uh, uh, comment to everybody that stood around him, including Doeg, was, "Who is going to give you land?" And power and these offices and 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 making captains of thousands and all this stuff. Who's going to do that? It's it's me. It's Saul, not mm -hmm. David, not not the shepherd boy. And I think David alludes to that in a more poetic fashion here in here in Psalm fifty two. It's like, what was Doeg's impetus for? Doing these unspeakable acts for, right. for, for selling salt in the first first place. You notice that, that we literally go from I, I think I think he meets with Abimelech I think in twenty. We go two chapters without uh, without Doeg saying a word to Saul. Right. The minute that money's brought up, Doeg speaks up. Uh, actually, <laughs> uh, I saw him down there with Abimelech. Um. Your motivator, where do you, where you draw your strength, where you draw your uh, your um, your power from, where you where you put most of your of your effort in, I think determines what kind of person you're going to be, you what kind of actions you're going to take. A, a person driven by money is never going to do the godly thing first. Right. Amen. Uh, can, can you be? Can you do godly things and prioritize money? Of course. Can you? Can you do? Uh, you know, you know, the, the the person who is you know uh, 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 more focused on football uh, than the Lord will will prioritize football. Football will be his strength. Football will be his only his only right. his only goal. And uh, the psalmist here. Takes it to note for all the righteous, as it's mentioned in, in, in verse six, uh, that this is this is what happens to a man that does not make God his strength, but is 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 entrusted in the things that are around him. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Now. I, I did point out the dichotomy between Doeg the shepherd and David the shepherd, um, and I think David points it out here. He says, "But I'm mm -hmm. 
but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Uh, the olive tree is one of the longest living tree, and David goes on further and and and, and makes himself like an olive and points himself like an olive tree that's in full sap, that's in that's in the height of its strength. Amen. You know, if if a, if a tree is dry, or you know, in the, in the winter time when all the you know the sap sort of runs down and, and there's and there's nothing. Uh, that they're really not producing anything. There's none of that photosynthesis that's going on with the leaves and everything. Uh, they, they become kind of brickly and, and, right. and, and easy to break. But but when they when they, when they're alive and alive, have you ever tried to break break a green branch off? They'll just sort of twist and pull and try to rip that thing off, and it just won't come off of there. Very irritating if you're trying to uh, uh, discipline a child. Uh, right. <laughs> but uh, the uh, but 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 the point is, in the green of his strength. And also the longest living tree. He he, he said he says he says I'm like an olive tree. So he, he makes himself out to be something that is that is powerful, that is long standing, that is long lasting. But where is he located? In the house of God. Amen. He said he says I am I, I am I am. I can't thank you. I think to me this is sort of an allusion to the first psalm in this book. I'm like a tree that's planted Amen. by the water. I'm not going to be moved. Amen. Um, David was letting you know that his roots, as they were sort of buried into the house of God, that that was where he was drawing his strength from. It, when, when the tree looks for sustenance, it looks up to the sun, and it draws water and nutrients from underneath. And David says, as I sort of suck from my roots, as I, as I look for a place to sort of bury myself up and look, I'm, I'm literally buried up in the house of God. Amen. In, in a place where I know the tree. And I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. So he, he kind of reiterates this point. There's a colon in between these two statements, which means that you know uh, the, the top half of the verse is uh, sort of explained in the second half. Uh, verse 9, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. Now, verse 9, I think, sort of wraps up his thoughts on Doe. He, even, he goes and he says, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. Amen. We look in the chapter that we looked at. Doeg did not immediately die. Doeg did not immediately come to ruin. Uh, Doeg, nothing that is mentioned in verse 5 of Psalm 52 happens to Doeg directly. But David takes it as, uh, and I think we should also look at, you know, maybe even sort of pity the, the loss in that their destruction is as if it's already happened. Amen. Their place where they're going, their, their, their ultimate destination for the lost, separate part, something uh, uh, miraculous happening on the part of the Lord for them, it is, is, is already predetermined. Mm -hmm. uh, the end is already written. You can go back to Revelations and every wicked thing that has ever existed, angels included, have already been designed for their ultimate fate. That's it. Amen. And David looks at, at Doeg's actions and says, I'm not going to worry about Doeg because God has already judged him, and it is as if he is already doomed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you look at the lost and, and how we understand uh, the, the, the lost estate to be, we know that to be the truth. Mm -hmm. They're already dead. They're already as good as is in hell. They're mm -hmm. already separated from God. Um, and it should almost make make us uh, 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 pity them in, in, a, in a way. It should make us want to reach out to them. I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. So David says, I, I'm going to treat this as if, if Doeg has already been taken care of, and in the meantime, I'm just going to be patient and wait. And I think we kind of see that at the end of, of 1 Samuel 22. He said, Abathar, come in, sit with me. We're going to hang out here until this sort of all blows over and you're going to be safe. Amen. Um, and and um, I, I think in a situation like this, you know, think about any time that someone, persecution for modern Christians is kind of, or American modern Christians is kind of rare. Um, right. But um, if we, if, you know, it's our immediate reaction to want to do something, to want to get the law involved, to uh, to have something snappy to say and come back. I'm 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 kind of a sarcastic person, and and and, and comebacks are, are are sort of a way that I deal with a lot of things. If if, if somebody gets on my nerve, and I, I'll have something smart to say to them. And and then, uh, but it, it, David says, "Don't worry about them. Can Their imagine? judgment's already meted out to them." And just wait. Just be patient. In in due season, in God's time, it'll be taken care of. Amen. 